True and Falsely Jesus in the Bible Part 6. Chapter 3. The Falsifier. Who was this falsifier? His identity will become clear from the following references for his own pagan doctrines from his own writings. The Christ Jesus according to the flesh was an Israelite who was also the eternally blessed God, Romans 9 verses 4 to 5. He is the exact likeness of God, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to be equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will he gave up all he had, and took the nature of a servant. He became like a man and appeared in human likeness, Philippians 2 verses 6 to 7. So he is the visible likeness of the invisible God, Colossians 1 verse 15. But he is the man, Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and men, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. As to his humanity, he was born of the seed of David, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to his divine holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 verses 3 to 4. He was the spiritual rock that went with Moses and his people to drink from it, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. When the right time finally came, God sent his own son, born of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law, Galatians 4 verse 4. But God did not compassionate for his own son, he delivered him, Romans 8 verse 32, to redeem those who were under the law, Galatians 4 verse 5. Because God's way now of putting people right with himself has been revealed. It has nothing to do with law. God puts people right through their faith in Jesus, Romans 3. 21-22, who was offered by God so that by his sacrificial death he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven only through their faith in him, Romans 3 verses 25-26. Who loved us and gave his life for us. Galatians 2 verse 20, never by doing what the law requires. Galatians 2 verse 16, for if a person is put right with God through the law, it means that Jesus died for nothing. Galatians 2 verse 21, Jesus became a curse for us. Because the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. But by becoming a curse, he has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings, Galatians 3 verse 13. Because those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse, Galatians 3 verse 10. For the law was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing, but where sin increased, God's grace increased much more, Romans 5 verse 20. Jesus died for the wicked at the time that God chose, Romans 5 verse 6, to show us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners, Romans 5 verse 8, that Jesus did not take the blood of goats and bulls to offer as a sacrifice. Rather he took his own blood and died to obtain eternal salvation for us, Hebrews 9 verse 12. Because sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out, Hebrews 9 verse 22. We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son, Romans 5 verse 10. Because just as all people were made sinners as the result of the disobedience of one man, Adam, in the same way they will all be put right with God as the result of the obedience of the one man, i.e. Jesus, Romans 5 verse 19. That means, God was making all mankind his friends through Jesus, and he did not keep an account of their sins, 2 Corinthians 5. 19. And if Jesus has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. And we are shown to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised Jesus from death that he did not raise, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 to 15. If our hope in Jesus is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. So if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved. This includes everyone, because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, God is the same Lord of all, Romans 10 verses 9 to 12. For Jesus will come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And those who have died believing in Jesus will rise to life first, then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. And so we will always be with him. So then encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 18. Yes, the falsifier is Paul, the founder of Pauline Christianity. This is a fact of history, his replacement of the genuine Christianity with another, polytheist, Gentile-wide and, pagan role for Jesus. The main role of Jesus in the Jewish world, as Jesus himself announced, was to bring them out of the darkness and into the light. He said, the light, Jesus, has come into the world but people, the Jews who did not believe in him, rather than the light because their deeds were evil. 
Anyone who does evil things hates the light and will not come to the light, because he does not want his evil deeds to be shown up. But whoever does what is true comes to the light in order that the light may show that what he did was in obedience to God. John 3 verses 19 to 21. In his role to bring the Jews out of the darkness and into the light, Jesus worked on them for more than three years. Moving from town to town preaching the true gospel in their temples and their synagogues, to fulfill the law, Matthew 5 verse 17, to call the sinners to repentance, Matthew 9 verse 13. To show them the true path to salvation by believing that there is only one God, and Jesus is his messenger. John 17 verse 3, as well as by keeping the commandments, faith alongside deeds, Matthew 19 verses 16 to 17. Then when the common Jew started to believe in him, the Pharisees and chief priests formed a council in order to decide what to do to stop this young man, Jesus. Because if they were to let him continue preaching, everyone would believe in him, causing the Roman authorities to take action and destroy their temples and their nation. During their council meeting a high priest named Caiaphas suggested to kill Jesus. His reason being. It is better for you to have one man die for the people, instead of having the whole nation, the Jews, destroyed. John 11 verses 45 to 50. They even made plans to kill Lazarus as well, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, because on his account many Jews were rejecting them and believing in Jesus, John 12 verses 10 to 11. The pagan world was faced with a tribulation in the form of a man named Paul. He introduced them to a mixture of heavenly scriptures with satanic, earthly inspiration, then mixed together with the alleged blood of Jesus. Truth, law, and encouragement to do good deeds were not ingredients in this mixture. They were removed because they cannot be combined in a mixture of fossil. Paul produced a new brand of faith that he claimed was not his own, but had come to him by personal inspiration from the alleged resurrected Jesus, even though he had never met him during his lifetime. Paul claimed that his brand of faith was actually more advanced than what Jesus preached during his lifetime. In fact, he thought himself to be the great interpreter of Jesus' mission, having explained it in a way that Jesus himself never did. Who was Paul? We know about Paul not only from his own letters, but also from the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, the admirer and missionary companion of Paul, who was also the author of the Gospel. But the information given by Paul about himself needs to be looked at through a lens of skepticism, because everyone has strong reasons for portraying himself in the best light possible. While the author of the book of Acts was clear and direct with his purpose and reason of writing the Acts, it was also a dedication to the same man Theophilus. Meaning, it was not an inspired book, but a man-made book littered with discrepancies. It cannot be a source of belief simply because it was a pure human effort. Although Luke had accompanied Paul on two missionary trips, he did not present Paul in the same light Paul presented himself in his letters. Paul was, at first, called Saul of Tarsus, Acts 9 verse 11, he gave information about himself as follows, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, in Asia Minor, a citizen of no mean city. Acts 21. 39, I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Romans 11 verse 1, I was circumcised on my eighth day. I am an Israelite, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As far as keeping the law is concerned, I was a Pharisee. Philippians 3 verse 5. The young Saul left Tarsus and came to the land of Israel. He said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, as a student of Gamaliel. I received strict instruction in the law of our fathers and was just dedicated to God as are all of you who are here today. Acts 22-3 Paul was a citizen of Tarsus, used to be called Saul of Tarsus, and had claimed to be a Roman citizen. Acts 16 verse 37, 22-25 Which would mean that his father was a Roman citizen. So, surely that meant he moved to Jerusalem when he was already a young man, not a young child? Paul and the early followers of Jesus Jesus and Paul never met. They did not know each other. Paul started to appear in the picture with the disciples and followers of Jesus after the ascension to heaven. Luke reported in his book, The Acts, many incidents regarding the relation between Paul and the early followers of Jesus, as well as Paul himself did in his letters. All these narrations by the two require research and analysis. The first appearance of the name Saul, who later became Paul, was in the book of Acts 7. He was involved, to some extent, in the death of Stephen, one member of the groups who worked with the disciples. Stephen opened the door. The story claims that Stephen was a man full of faith, the Holy Spirit, and was richly blessed by God. According to the story, he performed great miracles and wonders among the people. 
but he was opposed by some Jews who were members of the synagogue of the freedom, which had Jews from different locations who started arguing with Stephen. But the Spirit gave Stephen much wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. So they bribed some men to say, we heard him speaking against Moses and against God. In this way, they stirred up the people, the elders, and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and took him before the council. Then they brought forth some men to tell lies about him. They said, this man is always talking against our sacred temple and the law of Moses. We heard him say that this Jesus will tear down the temple and change all the customs which have come down to us from Moses. All those who were sitting in the council affixed their eyes on Stephen and saw that his face looked like the face of an angel. Acts 6 verses 5 to 15. The high priest asked Stephen, is this true? Stephen answered with a lengthy speech about Abraham, Moses, David and Solomon, and then he said to them, how stubborn you are. How heathen your hearts, how deaf you are to God's message. You are just like your ancestors, you too have always resisted the Holy Spirit. Was there any prophet that your ancestors did not persecute? They killed God's messengers, who long ago announced the coming of his righteous servant. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You are the ones who received God's law that was handed down by angels, yet you have not obeyed it. Acts 7 verses 1 to 53. Now for the shock in the following narration. As the members of the council listened to Stephen, they became furious and ground their teeth at him in anger. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw God's glory and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And said, Look, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7 verses 54 to 56. With a loud cry the council members covered their ears with their hands. Then they all rushed at him at once, threw him out of the city, and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They kept stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord. Do not charge them with this sin. He said this and died, Acts 7 verse 57 60. And Saul approved of his murder, Acts 8 verse 1. Is it not questionable that Stephen claimed to have seen God and Jesus standing next to his right side, instead of sitting as Mark 16 verse 19 relates? Or perhaps Stephen just wanted to prove that Jesus was not always sitting at the right hand of God. All the prophets and messengers of God, including Jesus himself, did not have the chance to see heaven opened for them, nor God for that matter. Was Stephen more righteous than Jesus and the prophets? Stephen claimed that he had seen two distinct personages next to each other, that means he already individualized each one with his own limited magnitude, space, and direction. What about the third God of the Trinity? Where was he? And how was it possible for Jesus to have been standing on the right hand of God if they, God and Jesus, are one and the same entity, as the Pauline Christians believe today? Anyway, Stephen would deserve the stoning as far as the Jews might be concerned for claiming to have seen two personages of God. Or he would deserve stoning from the Trinitarian's perspective due to his acknowledging only two personages rather than three. Glory be to God above how they described him. Of course, any book on the surface of the earth, that without divine sources, is fallible. But the claim of Stephen is a really far-fetched. And the problem lies in how people would believe such claims to be fact. How is it narrated in a so-called book of God as a fact, when it is in fact against the natural way in which God has created mankind, that no vision can encompass God? Furthermore, it is against the biblical texts as stated in the following verses, no one can see me and stay alive. Exodus 33 verse 20. No man has ever seen God. John 1 verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. 1 John 4 verse 12. And the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. John 5 verse 37. Even Paul himself wrote, he alone is immortal, he lives in the light that no one can approach. No one has ever seen him, no one can ever see him. 1 Timothy 6 verse 16. Another problem with Stephen is that the author reported him to be neglecting the true God and, therefore, called upon the servant Jesus only. In the text, he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord. Do not charge them with this sin. Act 7. 
5960, in his speech, Stephen considered Jesus as a righteous servant, but when the stoning began, he called upon him as a deity, ascribing him with God's divinity. It is difficult to understand that the author of the book of Acts presented Stephen first as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, richly blessed by God and full of power, but by the end. He was presented as a polytheist who was blaspheming. Perhaps Stephen simply opened the door to Jesus for the young Saul who was standing there, guarding the clothes at his feet and hearing Stephen calling Jesus. Paul persecuted the followers of Jesus. The author of the book, The Acts, told us that the young Saul, Paul, approved of the murder of Stephen. And that very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria, Acts 8 verses 1 to 2. Then he reported the story of the persecution four separate times in the book of Acts. The first account is in chapter 8 as reported by the author. He continued to tell us that, Saul tried to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragged out the believers, both men and women, and threw them into prison. Acts 8 verse 3. Surely, this young man, Saul, cannot do this on his own, unless he was authorized by some authority. Was he acting on behalf of the high priest? The second account is in chapter 9. The author recorded the connection between Paul and the high priest saying, then Saul, keeping up threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found there any followers of the way of Jesus, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. Acts 9 verses 1 to 2. The third account is in chapter 22. The author recorded Paul's personal account of his experience as given before the angry Jews in Jerusalem. Paul said, I was dedicated to God as are all of you who are here today. I persecuted to death the people who followed this way. I arrested men and women and threw them into prison. The high priest and the whole council can prove that I am telling the truth. I received from them letters written to fellow Jews in Damascus, so I went there to arrest these people and bring them back in chains to Jerusalem to be punished. Acts 22 verses 3 to 5. The fourth record of the persecution is again given by Paul himself in his own defense in a speech addressed to King Agrippa in chapter 26. Here, he says these words, I myself thought that I should do everything I could against the name of Jesus. That is what I did in Jerusalem. I received authority from the chief priests and put many of God's people in prison, and when they were sentenced to death, I also voted against them. Many times I had them punished in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecute them even to foreign cities. Acts 26 verses 9 to 11. What is the real secret of the relation between Saul and the high priests? The story is full of mysteries, but surely, it was the high priest's main plan, who was not only an official authority over the temple, but he was, in effect, a chief with his own armed force who gave permission to Saul to act on his behalf. Another question can be arise, such as, who gave the young Saul the power to threaten and attempt to murder the disciples? Why did Paul suddenly have the idea to cleanse Damascus, the non-Jewish city, from the followers of Jesus while Judea was still active with the new movement on the way of Jesus? What is behind such a motive? Did not the disciples remain in Jerusalem, with other followers scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria? If Saul, Paul, kept threatening and attempting to murder the disciples of Jesus, how many did he kill other than Stephen? And if he was going from house to house dragging out men and women throwing them into jail, was there still room in Jerusalem's jail for the men and women of Damascus to be brought back to Jerusalem? How many followers of Jesus did Saul expect to find in the synagogues of Damascus? Was he equipped with enough power to bring them all back in chains as prisoners, all the way to Jerusalem? Or he just took with him some anonymous false witnesses, selected them by himself? But definitely, through this official relation between Saul and the high priests, Saul was in the advantageous position to carry out his own plan. The alleged conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. The story of Paul's alleged conversion to Christianity or the turning point in his life was on the road to Damascus, while he was on his way there to arrest the followers of Jesus, men and women, and bring them back in chains to Jerusalem to be punished. The story is also recorded in the book of Acts in three separate occurrences. The three narrations are full of discrepancies and confusion. In any sort of investigation, the one who tells the truth keeps unchanged in his statements even with repetitions, making it very hard for anyone to accuse him of giving false witness. But the one who pretends to be speaking the truth, surely he will be easily exposed by having to repeat his story until it sticks, so to speak. 
the first narration is in Acts chapter 9, as related by the author. He said, as Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the voice said to him, Arise and go into the city. And you will be told what you must do. And the men who were traveling with Saul stood not saying a word, they heard the voice but they saw no one. Acts 9 verses 3 to 7. The second account is in Acts, chapter 22. The author continued recording Paul's personal account of his experience as given before the angry Jews in Jerusalem. Paul said, As I was traveling and coming near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and here you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Acts 22 verses 6-10 The third record is in Acts chapter 26. The author continued recording Paul's personal account in his own defense before King Agrippa. He said, I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who traveled with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you as my servant and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will rescue you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts 26 verses 12 to 18. There is no doubt that Paul was an intellectual, enlightened, active, influential and a philosopher. He was proficient and clever in that he did not enter Christianity through the door of the disciples. Instead, he chose the main door, he entered through Jesus himself, and appointed himself as an apostle and Jesus spokesman, away from the authority of the disciples. So no one could question him. Stephen had opened the door to Jesus for him. Paul saw it was acceptable for people to accept the claim of seeing God himself and Jesus standing next to his right side. Paul also claimed that he saw Jesus, and had a direct line with him. Through this direct line, and by his own techniques and patience, he succeeded to achieve his dream of having an ideological leadership in the society. Through his own church that was different from the church of the disciples, and his own doctrines that were different from Jesus' doctrines. He took some items from Jesus' life, such his miraculous birth, rumor of his alleged death and resurrection, the ascension and the returning and mixed them with some elements of the faith of the most popular. Classic superstitious religion to pagan cults and created his very own new religion. So, instead of Paul truly converting to Christianity, he converted Christianity to his own thoughts and philosophy. Paul's Christianity has remained a great trial for nations ever since. It was the will of God that allowed Satan to use Paul to bring this great trial to test people. It will remain so until the second coming of Jesus when all the truth about him will be clearly manifested again for all to see. Jesus already reminded people to be aware of such false prophets. He said, four false messiahs and false prophets will appear, they will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Listen. I have told you this ahead of time, Matthew 24. 24 to 25, and he also said, Many will say to me in that day, day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7 verses 22 to 23. Surely Paul will be the first one.
and whatever the hisses that Luke wrote about his very few miracles is just proving the warning of Jesus about him. As well as in, John 5 verse 43, Jesus already prophesied about this self-appointed messenger, who came in his own name, Paul, he said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Who is the person who came in his own name, and had more coverage in the New Testament than Jesus or even his disciples? The answer is Paul. So those who choose on their own will be doomed, because of not adhering to any warning or reminder, and just keeping with their inherited faith. Indeed they failed the great trial. But those who choose by their own will to be blessed, because they already seek the truth and take hold of it, indeed they pass the test.